Hi everyone, it's Vanessa. Welcome back to my channel. Today I wanted to do a wrap up of the last four things that I read, mostly at the end of January and at the beginning of February. The first thing that I will talk about is Burial Rites by Hannah Kent. This book follows Agnes as she is awaiting execution for two murders committed in the 1800s in Iceland. She's awaiting this execution by staying with a family nearby. This book has a reputation of being very slow and atmospheric and I think it definitely lived up to that. I really enjoyed the slow churn of this story. The questions of who is Agnes, where did she come from, why is she in this position, also her getting to know the family she was staying with and her defying the expectations that this family had of her were given to you like breadcrumbs throughout the story. I thought the character of Agnes was just fantastic. I don't mean fantastic in like a happy way. She lived pretty much a wretched life. I think this gets to the themes of the book very well. It's all encapsulated in who Agnes is. Agnes is orphaned, Agnes is poor, Agnes is a woman in a time when being a woman is not necessarily a great thing. Agnes is too smart for the people around her. Her intellect does not sit well with the other people in authority here. I read something really interesting when I was looking up stuff about this. I came across this. It says, Agnes commits a social crime since murder is a male crime in this time period. It's also, her intelligence is threatening. She is going against the main male characters, the authority figures here, and she kind of doesn't fit into this box of what a woman should be. She's very easy to be scapegoated because of that. There are other characters in the story aside from Agnes that I really did enjoy, especially the family, but there were some characters who did not leave me as satisfied, and, and this is a lot of the male characters if I'm being honest, kind of going back to who Agnes was with when these murders took place and learning about them as well. I think the main thing here is that a lot of these characters did not have any redeeming qualities whatsoever, that Agnes was at times so blind that she didn't realize what was actually happening before her eyes. She just wanted to be accepted so bad and loved so bad that she didn't realize that these people were just bad. I think that's something that Hannah Kent could have maybe tweaked and made their relationships a lot more complex where I could have seen what Agnes was seeing but maybe what she was getting at is just that, that she didn't care who was giving her this supposed love and this affection so long as it was somebody giving her this love and attention and care when she had never had that before in her life. The only thing that fixes this, I think, is the ending. The ending hits you like a punch in the gut. It is so beautifully written. They are lines that are not going to be easily forgotten for me or the people that I buddy read this with because it was just so, so, so good. Overall, I do recommend this book. There is not that much going on. It's a character study and if you like character Characters. Agnes is definitely a character that you should meet. The next thing I'll talk about is a graphic novel, Goldie Vance by Hope Larson, Brittany Williams, and Sarah Stern. This is a brand new comic series and it focuses on Goldie Vance right there. She lives with her dad in a hotel in Florida. She works as a valet there, but really what she enjoys doing is going to the detective services department and helping them try to solve crimes in this hotel. So this has the air of Nancy Drew. It has as the heir of Veronica Mars. She's trying to solve mysteries and trying to solve little crimes that are happening in this hotel. I thought this was super cute and fun. I think it's very easy for me to love this just because I do love female main characters who are sleuths. Goldie is street smart. She is super self-confident and she tells it like it is and I love reading characters like that. I do think like Nancy Drew and Veronica Mars, sometimes the mystery solving is a little bit too easy for me. There are no real obstacles like you know it's going to be fixed in a few panels, but I didn't mind that too much just because I loved Goldie and her friends. I think number one in this is the representation. I loved, loved, loved the vast array of different types of people portrayed in this comic. This is the Florida that I know. I really enjoyed seeing her friends and her family and I definitely want that to be more discussed in future volumes. I want to hear from her about how she sees herself. Pretty much anything you could ever want from a set of characters from 
from a world when it comes to inclusiveness and differences I think you would find in Goldie Vance. The story isn't amazing, it's not life-changing, but I love the character. I definitely will continue to read this to continue to see how Goldie grows and learn more about who she is. The next thing that I will talk about is Milk and Honey by Rupi Kaur. This is a poetry collection that focuses on love and pain and breaking up, what it means to be a woman. I think Milk and Honey is a very approachable poetry collection and as someone who is just starting to get into poetry, it was very easy for me to read. It uses simple language, kind of stream of consciousness. What she's thinking is what you're getting. Definitely I found some really beautiful lines in here which I marked and I'll read you some of them. You must enter a relationship with yourself before anyone else. The next time he points out the hair on your legs is growing back, remind that boy your body is not his home, he is a guest. Warn him to never outstep his welcome again. This one about fathers really spoke to me. This is why poetry is important. Sometimes it speaks just right to you. It says, Father, you always call to say nothing in particular. You ask what I'm doing or where I am, and when the silence stretches like a lifetime between us, I scramble to find questions to keep the conversation going. What I long to say most is, I understand this world broke you. It has been so hard on your feet. I don't blame you for not knowing how to remain soft with me. Sometimes I stay up thinking of all the places you are hurting, which you'll never care to mention. I come from the same aching blood. From the same bone, so desperate for attention, I collapse in on myself. I am your daughter. I know the small talk is the only way you know how to tell me you love me, because it is the only way I know how to tell you. So that one really, really hit me in a time when I haven't been as great with my dad. You should be feeling some of the same themes and subjects as she is talking about for it to really hit you. Um, I didn't feel like a lot of the subjects fully spoke to me, especially with the hurting and the breaking, just because I've never personally gone through the amount of pain and the amount of abuse she has gone through here is very important for a lot of people to read and I definitely understand that. I understand why so many people love this collection, but personally I have never felt those emotions. I don't think that the language that she used helped me get in the mind frame of what she was going through just because it was so simple. So that's, that's the only real criticism I have of this. It's not anything with the actual collection. It's about me. It's about me not connecting with it as much as I I can imagine other people would connect with it. But definitely worth your time, not very long, really approachable, and I really enjoyed the illustrations in it as well. The last thing that I will talk about is the Nordic theory of everything. Might have a lot to say about this, so get ready, I guess. The main argument in this book is that the American system should take notes on how the Nordic countries do all kinds of things like healthcare, taxes, schooling, and college. The author argues that this gives you more freedom when you're not worried worrying so much about these confusing, sometimes very complicated issues, and that's here in America, we don't really do that. I didn't really find any big, real problems with her arguments. Like, overall, I think her argument is valid. For a lot of it, I was nodding my head. However, I think it's the way that she argues these points. It's done in a very simplistic way, in a very repetitive way, just always comes back to, don't you see it? Don't you see it, America? Why don't you do it like this? Sure, we see it. I see it. A lot of people around me see it. But I think there are other things stopping us from taking notes and doing things the way that the Nordic countries are doing it. The problem that I had with this book, I think that she did not truly contemplate these bigger questions, the opposition that any Nordic country might be facing when it comes to these programs are completely different than what we are facing just because our history is different and the way we do things and see things is different than the Nordic countries. There's two specific ideas that I think are really big to this argument that she either glosses over or when she attempts to argue it, she doesn't give it the justice that these issues deserve. One of them is that I think the Nordic countries are a a lot more okay with government working for them. And I think in America, we view the government as the enemy a lot of the times. Nordic countries believe if we are all taken care of, we can all succeed. And Americans believe that help 
is a sign of weakness. If we are given handouts, if we are on welfare, we are part of the problem. We are not taking care of ourselves and of our families and we are making other people take care of us. And I think that's a very pervasive argument in America. You need to take care of your own and you shouldn't be expecting other people to take care of you. And being able to do so, being able to provide is the freedom that they view. Secondly, which I think is very related to this idea, is the issue of race. And this is one that she really glosses over. She brings up, you know, we people say we're a homogeneous country in Finland and in Sweden and we're very white. And she's like, no, actually we have refugees and we have immigrants and they are part of this whole system and it still works. But I think what she does not make clear and she does not really delve into is the <laughs> more than 300 year history of racial problems, racial discrimination, racial contempt that we have in America. The Nordic countries and our country are very different in the way that they view race and in the way that race has played out in our history. So to me those are huge arguments that she is just either completely evading or very easily glossing over and not taking time on. And for this book being like 350 pages, she continues to talk and talk and talk, but I felt like she never really gave anything that was substantial. Not a bad argument, but I think the execution of it, not so good. It was an interesting way to look at other countries, and I do bring it up often now, so it wasn't a complete waste of my time, but I will say I did not finish the book. I didn't finish like the last 50 or so pages. So that is it for those four things that I read. And if you have any questions or if you read any of these books, leave me a comment down below so we can continue talking about it. Thanks so much for watching my video. I'll see you in my next one. Bye-bye.